your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word if you're able to. We're in a, a series on Sunday mornings that we've, that we've titled Beholding His Glory. This will probably be the last message in this series until after the first of the year. We'll change gears here and be preaching more Christmas messages and and so forth, and then New Year's, but uh, after first year we'll resume this. The preacher's taking a long time to get through this. Well, it's, it's a good book, amen? John chapter, John chapter 18, let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Kedron, where it was a garden, in, where it was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. And Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and, and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come unto him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he get them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, and they said Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If, thou, if therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Notice back in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Kedron, where it was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, He's in the Garden. And let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we realize you're not in the garden now. You're at the right hand of the Father. And we thank you for that. You ever liveth. Make an intercession for us even this morning. And Lord, I pray that even now that you would intercede for me for forgiveness of sin and, and cleansing. And, and Lord, for the power of God and the Holy Spirit on my life as I preach the Word of God. Lord, this is your people that's in this auditorium. Lord, they need to hear from heaven. They need to hear from God. They don't need to hear from a lowly preacher. Lord, they need to hear from heaven. Lord, they need their hearts stirred this morning. They don't need to just come to a service and hear some words said and sing some songs and leave the same way that they came. Lord, they need to be challenged. And Lord, I can't do that, but you can. So hide me behind the cross. Lord, take over. Lord, may you increase and may I decrease. May they see you high and lifted up. May you be exalted before their eyes. And Lord, I pray that you'd stir their hearts as they never have been before. Bless now the preaching of thy word for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. It's kind of an unusual thought here that you might see that we looked at this when Jesus spoke of these words. They went over the brook of Kedron. You know, if you do some study and look at it, very seldom... Did Jesus stay inside the walls of Jerusalem? He's often found outside the walls at night at different times. He, he would stay at, at Bethany and different places like that. And, and very seldom was he, did he spend a night in Jerusalem. And here on this particular night, he leaves the, the, the walls of Jerusalem, goes outside the walls, and he goes into, into crosses over the, the brook Kedron over into a garden there. And that garden is on the Mount of Olives. If you look at the locations on the Mount of Olives, and it's called Gethsemane. It's a garden that he many times would go in and he would pray there and he would go to the, the Mount of Olives. And in Luke chapter 21, verse 37, says in the daytime he, he was teaching in the temple and at, that, at night he went out and abode in the Mount that is called the Mount of Olives. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 39 it says that he came out and went as he was wont, otherwise meaning was his manner or his custom to do, to the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him. So it was very common for him to, 
leave and go outside of Jerusalem, outside of, and go up into the Mount of Olives there, or the Garden of Gethsemane, or, or, or there in that area uh, on the Mount of Olives. It was, a, it was a quiet place, a place that he would go and that he would pray and that he would spend time with the Heavenly Father. It was a, a place of, uh, 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 that he desired to be many times. And, and we find in this particular instance here that that he goes to this garden. He, he knows that his time is short. He knows that, that Judas is, is bringing a band of men. He goes out into the garden. We could go to other scripture. And in the garden there he prays. And that's where he prayed that great priestly prayer. Which we have preached about the, the past couple of messages in this series. And, and how that he prayed for you and I and, and others. And... He's finished that prayer now, and, and now he gets up. He walks back to the disciples, the disciples, and we could go to other, other gospels, and we could find that they had fallen asleep several times, and he had woke them up. And now he comes back knowing that Judas is on his way. Judas is on his way, and he's bringing a, a, a band of men with him, and, and, and he, he knows this. So we find here Judas knew where Jesus went because he went there often. And verse 2 says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. He knew the place. He knew where Jesus went. He had been there before with Jesus. He knew that he could find him there. And so he gathered this band of men. And it goes on and says, For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. So Judas knew the place. He knew where, where he could find him. And for Jesus, as I said, oft times went there. Christian, can I ask you this question this morning? Do you know the place? Do you know the place where you can find him? Many, to be honest with you, they say, well, you know, I, I have trouble finding him. There's a place you can find him. A place of stillness, a place that, that you can find him even this morning in your life. You know, I'm amazed at how many Christians who seem to can't find the Lord. They're not looking, to be honest with you. We live in a day and time when a lot of Christians just live in their lives for themselves and not really looking for the Lord. And they miss out on what the Lord has from Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. The problem that we got today is that many Christians aren't looking for the Lord with their heart. They're not looking and seeking after him. You know, it's amazing Judas knew where he could find him. Christian, we can find him when we search for him with all of our heart. Yet many times we get so tied up with this world and uh, the world begins to take a piece of this of our heart and a piece of that of our heart and a piece of this of our heart. It may be that, that your job's got this big piece of your heart and, 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 and your materialism, your vehicles and everything else has got this part of your heart and, and your friends and your party has got this part of your heart and, and something else has got this part of your heart and, and you're scattering your heart abroad. When it's so scattered like that, it's hard to seek the Lord with all your heart. Because so many things are pulling you different ways. You know, I love this time of year. And you've probably heard me say this before, but this is one of the hardest times of the year to preach. You say, preach, I'll be the easiest time. It's not that it's hard to know the message that God has. But what is hard is that many times the people's attention and their hearts are every place else. Their minds are every place else. They're thinking, I've got to do this this week. I've got to buy this this week. I've got to go here this week. I've got this to do this week. I've got these people coming this week. And, and it, they're just so scattered and they come in and they sit down and they're not seeking the Lord with their heart. And it becomes difficult to preach sometimes. And so, many times, Christians, we go through the year and we let everything, not just at Christmas, we let everything else take precedent and take a hold of our heart. You'll find Him when you seek Him with all your heart. It's too many times where Christians are struggling and battling back and forth. They're looking in all the wrong places. They're they, they, they wouldn't, hey, listen, the, 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 uh, the, the Pharisees and that, that band of men and Judas wouldn't have found him if they had went inside the walls of Jerusalem. They wouldn't have found him there. Uh, he was in a quiet place in the garden. 
Hey, listen, you won't find the Lord out in the world doing the things of the world. You won't find him there. You won't find he's, he's right at the right hand of the Father. He's that place of surrender. When you find yourself that you want to surrender your heart to the Lord, he's right there. When you decide, you know what, I want to get close to the Lord. And I, want to, I want to be more like him. That's where he's at. When you want to say, I want to have a greater fellowship with him and I want, to, I want to know him better, he's right there. That's where he's at. When you get into the Word, say, I want to know his Word and I want to put it in my heart and I want to know more about him from the Word of God, he's right there. That's where he's at. When the, in the stillness of the, uh, of the night, maybe, when you're laying on your bed and you're thinking, oh, Lord, I want to think upon you about your greatness and your goodness, guess what? That's where he's at. When you decide, Lord, you're all I need, that's where he's at. When you're going through the difficult times and say, Lord, I'm, I'm trusting you, that's where he's at. When you face the problems of life and you say, Lord, I want to face it with you, that's where he's at. And so many times we fail to get to that place of surrender, that place of where he's at. He's in that place of repentance when we sin against the Lord and we, we call upon him. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Guess what? That's where he's at here in that prayer. When there's that humility, when pride is trying to take over and you humble yourself before the Lord, guess what? He's right there. He's in that place of fellowship. We need to quit looking in all the wrong places where he's not. And we need to begin to find him in all those places that, that we just talked about. You see, some can't find also, can't find him because they're blind. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 and 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Otherwise, a person that's never received Christ as their Savior. It says, in whom the God of this world, who's the God of this world? Satan. He's the God of this world. In whom the God of this world, you notice it's a little g, hath, and it could be things, it could be money, it could be all kinds of things, it could be uh, uh, possessions, it could be self, it can be pride. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, I, I often stop and think about uh, what would people do and, 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 and was even talking with Houston, we was talking yesterday a little bit and, uh, about how, uh, how, how can this world face uh, what's going on in the world? How can they face the troubles and the, and the difficulties and the struggles and all the problems of this world without Jesus Christ? Well, generally what they do, they turn to the drugs or they turn to the liquor or they turn to, to uh, the immorality or they turn to uh, everything else trying to drown it out, trying to, to soothe their conscience or trying to find something to replace which they can't replace and that's Jesus Christ. They're blinded. They're blinded. Satan tries to keep their mind on everything else. Tries to keep their heart on everything else. And so they're looking in all the wrong places for what will fulfill them, that what will give them peace, what will help them. The lost, uh, uh, the lost can find him, though, if they will. If they would desire, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can find him. He's not hard to find. It's just you've got to want to find him. It's just got to want to find him. You know, there's times that in your life, in my life, different things that there's something that, oh, I need this or I need that. And, and, uh, and, you're, and you look around the house and you're looking for it and you're looking for it and you say, oh, well, just forget it. It's not that important to you. But then there's those things sometimes that you say, I've lost this. Where's it at? Where's that? And you'll turn everything upside down looking for it. You'll have other people looking for it. And you'll dig through this and you'll go back to where you've already looked again and you'll look again and you'll look again and you'll go back and say, I know it's got to be here somewhere and you'll go again and again and again looking for it because it's so important to you. You'll never receive Jesus Christ your Savior until it becomes important to you to live for eternity. You'll never seek Jesus Christ as your Savior until you, until you come to a place where it's more important to you than dying and going to a devil's hell. 
You'll never receive Jesus Christ as your Savior until it becomes more important to you than all the things of this world. It's got to become the most important thing because then you'll seek for it. And he said, and I will be found of you. He'll knock at your heart's door. He'll bring conviction and he'll draw you to him. Oh, that you would come and seek him. Satan wants to blind you and keep you from receiving Christ your Savior. But many are looking in all the wrong places. Jesus came to meet them in the garden when they came looking for him. He, he came to meet them. Look in verse 4 here. It says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth. Well, let me just stop there and throw in a little side note. It don't cost you any extra this morning. And that is Jesus knows all things. Not in my notes, but I just got to, when I read that, I just can't help but touch on a little bit. Jesus knows all things. Number one, he knows your heartache. He knows where you're at spiritually. He knows the needs in your life. He knows the desires in your life. He knows if you are saved and if you're not saved. He knows what's going on tomorrow before it ever comes. He knows what's going on all week, next week, before it ever gets here. He knows you from the beginning to the end. He knows, let me say it again, all things. All things. That's why we can trust him. Because he knows all things. And he's able to take care of all things if we'll trust him. But notice here he says, it goes on and says, that, Therefore knowing all things he, uh, that should come upon him, he went forth. And said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered and said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Jesus knows all things. Nothing escapes his knowledge. When you, when he come, when you come seeking him, he knows it. When you come seeking him, he'll come to you. Well, I can go back over and, and, and read the scripture if, if I need to. It says, if we'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us. He knows all things and he knows when we draw nigh to him. Well, Jesus knew that they was coming in the garden, so he went out to meet them. He knew why they was coming. He knew that they was coming to take him, that they might crucify him. He didn't run from it. He went and he met them that he might die at Calvary for you and I and shed his precious blood that we might have eternal life. He might rise again from the grave and, and so that we can have life ever after. He went forth. He met them. And he'll come meeting you when you come seeking him. Just like the father of the prodigal son. When he went out to meet him and the son came home. Christian, when you come seeking the Lord, he knows it. And he'll come to meet you. You know, when those difficult times come, and those struggles come and you come seeking the Lord. He's going to get up and come right to you to meet you there in that time of need. The prodigal son had went down into the far country, which represents the wickedness of this world. And he had left his father. He said, Father, give me all that belongs to me. Give me my inheritance. And he took everything that his father gave him and, and he left and went down. The Bible says that he, he wasted it all on righteous living, otherwise wicked living and just splurging and, and all kinds of wicked living. And when the famine came and there wasn't any food, he joined, a, here's a Jewish boy, and he joined himself to a, 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 a farmer that was raising hogs. That would have been terrible. But he was hungry and he said that he, he, that he was so hungry that he feigned. He desired to eat just the husk off of the corn. That's pretty hungry to eat the husk. And he finally come to himself, the Bible says, and he, he said, my father has many servants. And he said, they have plenty to eat. What I'll do is I'll arise from here. I'll go home and tell my father I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Just make me one of your hired servants. He got up and he headed home. What he didn't realize is that probably every day his dad walked out on that porch and looked down that lonely road looking for that son, hoping that that son would come home one day. As he began to walk up that road, his father seen him and, and uh, he, he no doubt thought, that's my son. I can tell by the way he's walking. I can tell. I know that's my son. And he come down off that porch and he went out and he took a hold of that son and he, he met him out there. His son came seeking him, but his father went seeking him, went to him. 
Aren't you glad that we got a Father, a Heavenly Father? When we come seeking Him, doesn't matter that we've been down in the hog pen of life. When we return home, He comes seeking us. Wraps His arms around us. He cares for us and He loves us and He desires for us to be home there. In Luke 15, 2 on, He said He arose and came to His Father. But when He was yet a great way off, His Father saw Him and had compassion and ran and fell, fell on His neck and kissed Him. Well, what a picture of our Heavenly Father. What a picture of our Savior. That with, when Jesus, he went forth that they might uh, take him. Hey, listen, our father will come to us. But when Jesus met them there in the garden, he went to them. He asked them a question. He asked them a question. And this was the question. Whom seek ye? Whom seek ye? You know, that might be a, a good thing to put over the door back there. On the outside, before you walk in the auditorium, whom seek ye? This world, a lot of times, not seeking the Lord. Even in churches today, we don't come seeking the Lord. We come seeking maybe the preacher say something that'll be funny, or maybe that'll uh, uh, that we'll enjoy, or something like that, and we don't come seeking the Lord. Or maybe they come seeking to hear the music, or, and, or maybe come. Seeking to, to see friends and, and to see different people that maybe they don't get to see but once a week. It's a good question. When we walk through those doors, we ought to come seeking the Lord. But he said, whom seek ye? And they answered him. He said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. What they didn't realize is they didn't really know who they were seeking. Even Judas didn't really know who he was seeking. They said Jesus of Nazareth, which that would have been his earthly, lowly name, Jesus of Nazareth. The carpenter's son. Just a man from Nazareth named Jesus. But Jesus saith unto them, I am. You say, well, preacher, you just tell him no. You see, when Moses went out into the wilderness on the backside of the mountain there, and, and the Lord was calling him, Moses out to, to go lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, then that burning bush, and when he took off his shoes and he stood before that burning bush, and God spoke to him out of that bush after the conversation of what he was supposed to do and go and, and, and lead the people out and meet Aaron and so forth like that. He asked him, he said, well, who do I tell them sent me so that they'll know? And our Heavenly Father said, tell them, I am sent you. I am. When Moses went, and he began to explain to the people, he had to tell them that the I am sent him. And all of Israel knew who I am is. That night, when they came to take Jesus, he says, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And they were saying, we're looking for this man that was a carpenter's son. His name's Jesus. They didn't realize that the answer that they was going to get was, I am he. If you read on down, it says that they fell backwards. Why? Because there's power in the name of the I am. Amen. They couldn't stand before the I am. Can I tell you something this morning? Not a single person in this room will stand before the I am. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Who is that preacher? The I am. Jesus Christ, the King of glory. 
the I am. And he said, I, I am he. And they fell back. And so we asked them again. Who are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And so he replies again, but basically in a different form, I am he. I'm the one you're seeking, the carpenter's son. I'm the one you're seeking, the Jesus of Nazareth. Because you don't recognize me as the great I am. And oh, how many times, Christians, do we call upon him, but we don't recognize him as the great I am. You know, some people, they think of Jesus as just a babe in a manger. At that time of year, we see nativities, and we got nativities all over our house, and but he's more than just a babe in a manger. He's the great I am. He's the mighty God. He's the prince of peace. He's the counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and morning star. My friend, he's the I am. He's God. And so many people are looking for, for a, a babe in a manger or they're looking for a, a, a man on a cross. But my friend, he's at the right hand of the Father. And he's the great I am. He's not the I was or I will be. He's the I am today, forever, for eternity. When we come to the Lord, he'll come to us. But we need to be looking for the great I am. You see that power there. So as soon as they had said that unto him, uh, he had said unto them, I, I am he. They went backward and fell to the ground. They didn't come to the garden seeking the I am. They come seeking Jesus, the son of Joseph. So let me ask you this morning, who are you seeking? Who are you seeking? Well, preacher, uh, I'm seeking the one that saved my soul. But do you realize he's the I am, the mighty God? When you come to the, when you come to the garden uh, where, where you know Jesus is, are you just looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, or the babe in the manger, or, the, or, or Jesus on the cross? Are you looking for the I am, the great and mighty God, the almighty God, as I said? You see, he's the master, he's the creator. One day, that great I am will be your judge and my judge. We'll kneel before him. Jesus of Nazareth was a good man, but the I am is Lord. Jesus of Nazareth won't cause you to, to fall backwards uh, in conviction of sin, but the I am will. He's more than just a man. He's God. Who are you looking for in your life? You know, we stop and we... I hopefully you'll stop this time of year and you'll think about what all that God has done in sending his son. But I hope that you won't stop there. I hope that you'll consider it and, and look from the manger to the, to the cross, to the tomb, to the right hand of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the I Am. Whom seek ye? This morning, he says, I want you to seek me for forgiveness of sin. I want you to seek me for peace in your heart. I want you to seek me for strength in the difficult times. I want you to strength, or seek me for the joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. I want you to seek me for, 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 the, the, for, the, for a hand that will direct your life and to guide you and, and, and to and put you on the right path. So I want you to seek me this morning and, 
uh, for, for, for those who are lost or in, in your family. He said, I want you to seek me in prayer. I want to have fellowship with you. And then he comes back and says, because I'm the I am. This morning, the great I am, the King of kings, the Savior of the world, the judge of the universe, the almighty God. He looks at you as an individual, not as a group of people in this auditorium, but as an individual. He says, will you come seeking me? He says, I'm looking for you. Will you come seeking me? He says, when you come, he said, seek me with all your heart. And you'll find me. This morning, maybe you need to find him afresh and anew. And realize once again, he's more than just a babe in a manger. He's God. He's the great I.